So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for the first part of looking at Horsef in the uh, when Queen Victoria came onto the throne in 1837, then uh, going past the 1841 census and ending really on the 1851 census. We're seeing houses of Horsef developed during that period, uh, and it's taken from a number of sources. Uh, like I say, there's stuff from the museum, there's stuff from uh, trade directories and things like that, and obviously the census itself. And uh, like I say, 1837 is quite a good year to start, not only because of Queen Victoria being on the throne, is that the tithe map of uh, horses was actually published. What we're looking at here first, I'll set off on this first screen here, because this is a, a map of horses from 1775. So you can see how the rudimentary, the road system was. So if we're going to look at it, we've got the Brownbury Lane coming up here as a principal one going out to horses. We've got West End Lane coming up there, meeting at four lane ends further down there. And then the important road, which is still a minor road today, although it's got more important in the last five years, uh, is Carvely Lane coming down here, crossing Carvely Bridge. That was built in 1710, uh, going across the River Eyre there. And then coming further around, we're going to look at the uh, Newley area as well. Um, it's not quite pictured on this uh, map here because uh, Newley Bridge wasn't built until 1819 at a cost of £1,500 by uh, John Pollard um, around, around there as well. Uh, quite a sum of money because he recouped his money by charging a toll across it. And we also noticed down here is that the A65 hasn't been built. Uh, and so you can say it's centered horse right up here uh, on the town street, as we've seen, uh, we've got the hall in the park there of where the Stanhopes live. The time we come to this uh, period is the Stanhopes weren't living in horses anymore. Around about 17, the late 18, uh, 1700s, uh, probably around about eight in, to 1800, is that they'd left horse of uh, they'd intermarried with the Spencer family of uh, Cannon Hall, and the Stanhopes had to adopt the Spencer name in order to inherit uh, the money down there. And obviously, it was quite a good match as well because there was sort of a, both families made money uh, really from industry, as I think I mentioned before. Is that Stanhopes were uh, principal uh, um, promoters of the Leeds Liverpool Canal, which had been completed in 1777 in this area around here. So we've got that on the map coming down here. The other thing you won't notice, that, and that did happen in the period that we're going to talk about, is that the railway came along here, the first one coming along the Air Valley, and then the second one coming up the Woodside uh, and going out to Harrogate and then on to Thirsk uh, when it was originally built, both those lines coming out of Leeds. The other principal road uh, to look at here um, is, I'm making sure I get it on the right one, um, is down here is Butcher Hill, uh, largely because of, uh, sorry it's over here, Butcher Hill round here because that went up then to meet the main road into Leeds, the one that came from Otley, uh, as we know it today as Otley Old Road. And so really, if you want to go to Leeds, you had to go up Butcher Hill uh, to pick up the road round here, because as you can see on the map, there's no road down here at all, because that wasn't built until 1827, 1830, when it was sort of complete uh, around there. And so that was an Im Im a very important road. That's why when we see the development of Woodside down here, it wasn't where we've probably think of it today along Low Lane, but it's really around Tan House Hill uh, down here at the bottom, because that's where Outward Lane came across down to, uh, and uh, other roads came down there because it was a principal one. The other one that led out to it, is, uh, as it still does today, is Scotland Lane, as you can see, coming along here to join uh, Otley Old Road up by the uh, High Trees Garden Centre up there. So that, that came, came round that way as well. And uh, say if you did live down in New Lay like that down here, is that the principal road then was Drury Lane, because we'll probably only think of it a very short stretch uh, just off the bottom of Town Street uh, today. But that's where it came, and it came all the way down to Newley. So it was a very important road, uh, Drury Lane was, and really been uh, usurped really by the uh, Ring Road when that was built in the, in the 1930s. Uh, and then we've got Stanhope uh, Avenue and other roads like that, so sort of uh, becoming the main roads instead of Drury Lane around there. So that's what we've been sort of uh, uh, looking at on on there, uh, and um, I'll just look. I just check my notes down here because I think I've covered uh, them all down there uh, uh, as well. And the other one is that uh, 
also built in this period that we're going to look at, uh, you know, if we look at the top of um, Town Street, uh, Long Row, is that the sort of the, uh, what hasn't really been developed down here is uh, Bachelor Lane down there, which is a, was came quite an important road, but now quite a, 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 a narrow road and hard to get up and down. Uh, so there's really not much down at Woodside, even on this map of 1775. We'd have had the corn mill down there, which is probably this building here and some other buildings there as, as well, probably very small mill type developments. So village life was principally uh, focused on the town street, as I looked at uh, last week as well. And they could say there was a shops. This is where the school was, St Margaret's today, and where the church was on the green. And uh, it had quite a small population when we look at in 1831 of just 3,435 people. From the earlier census, from 10 years earlier in 1821, is that it had grown by 601 people. So it wasn't a massive growth or anything like that. It was as quite a, a steady growth that we'll see. Whereas other towns really in the sort of 1820s has started to grow very rapidly. I'm thinking of Bradford here, just tying back uh, to uh, looking at the Worcester industry uh, that came over there and Samuel Marsden who brought that mo uh, who brought the uh, sheep uh, wool across from Australia and really that sort of uh, set off the Worcester industry. It had been qu in quite a doldrums really and it would have hit horse in other places uh, largely after the French wars. There was a huge uh, dip in the economy sort of 1818, 1819, 1820 in that period and really no mills uh, were built in that time because there was really no demand for the cloth but come the 1820s there was a huge demand and we had these much larger mills being built in Bradford and, and in Leeds as well and but it didn't roll out to somewhere like Horse so they still had quite small mills in here and that's why we don't see really the effect of the mills coming on really until the sort of late 1850s and then going on to uh, the to the end of the century uh, really when we had the much bigger mills built um, around here but otherwise it was largely what we probably call today a rural economy uh, with blacksmiths, wheelwrights, boot and shoe uh, makers and quite a number of uh, shopkeepers on Town Street uh, and you've got to think of uh, looking at this sort of map down here we've got Mr Rhodes there, the Reverend Rhodes um, being the tenant uh, in uh, uh, in the new hall in, in the park. But we see down here, we've got all the buildings coming down Town Street, but there was many uh, coming down Fink Hill as, as well. And really that sort of, it was a, a shopping center in its own right. And I think it's only probably since the 1950s is that there really, there'd been a decline in the number of shops on there and because of the realignment of the roads. And as we see here, is that we've got the um, the main road coming up here as well. We've got the fleece being built in 1830. And really that dragged uh, a lot of um, shops into that area. So we really see the first development around the fleece, around the A65 as well. So the continuation really of Town Street, Fink Hill, and then down onto what we call Park Side today, all those shops down there. Uh, and they're, they're the, really the first earliest buildings built on the uh, new roadside uh, were in that uh, around the, the fleece itself. And they could say, um, a number of well-to-do people uh, lived in Horsef, uh, and you could say is a, a lot of people have started to move, uh, businessmen and uh, others have started to move out of Leeds, largely because it was a, a, a smelly uh, place with uh, lots of infectious diseases and things like that. So really in this period, they started to move out to places like Headingley uh, and uh, probably into Horsef as well, um, especially later on with the arrival of the railway. And um, so uh, we got the sort of the, the Craven still living out of Scotland Lane at Owlet Grange. Uh, we got the Micklethwaite family who were great landowners beyond the Stanhopes uh, down at Newley and the Morfits, they owned the Mabgate Linen Mills in Leeds and they lived at Upper Bank House. I say within this period, they rebuilt it in 1838 to what we see today. So that's the one just off the uh, 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 bottom of Town Street, the top of Back Lane, because they, the main landowners still remain the Stanhopes, uh, and because they they really sort of held lands here, uh, and I guess they might still own a bit of a land here, right through to the sort of fifties uh, and nineteen seventies. 
the two halls they had, because now they lived at Cannon Hall, because they were rented out, as we see on this map here, rented here to the Reverend Rhodes uh, and other notable families in Horsef uh, who would sort of uh, partook in the sort of uh, administration of the town were the Stables and the Watson families. Education had already uh, established the town school, which I mentioned uh, last week, uh, when St Margaret's, uh, the land was there, uh, given by the Stanhopes. Uh, and in this period, it expanded in 1834, uh, when an additional story was added to the old school. So that had been a single story building to begin with, and uh, because they first built 1780. And because they, uh, an upper floor was added that really for the teaching of girls, so to split the, uh, the, the sex is there together. I guess you would still have had to pay to go uh, to the school weekly. So there wouldn't have been enormous numbers of uh, children going to there because it seemed as quite a costly thing to do. Uh, and uh, because they, they were head teacher in 1841 and probably uh, right at the beginning of this period was William Thompson. He was aged 35. But that really wasn't the only school around because there were lots of uh, private schools. There was Mary uh, Crowsdasis Ladies Boarding and Day School. James Whitaker had a school that opened in 1834. And uh, he would have been about uh, age 24 as being the teacher there. And he had 28 boarders at that school. Um, 16 of those were girls aged between five and 10 years old and 12 boys in the same age room. Uh, range. They, uh, he held his school at Moss House off um, Scotland Lane, probably just off this map, uh, but it's before you go down uh, the dip, Moss House is to the left hand side if you're going out towards Otley Old Road. And like I said, there was another boarding school on Scotland Lane as well, and this was Bellevue, uh, now Beach House, that's to the right hand side down a track, uh, really where the Victorian houses are at the beginning of Scotland Lane, it's rather a large house and its own private gardens there. And because that was another boarding school, and they had 19 boarders there, 14 uh, were boys aged 8 to 15, and five girls in the same age group, uh, group as well. And so there were sort of boarding schools, were probably what sort of Charles Dickens wrote about in the, uh, some of his novels as well. Um, but because they didn't last particularly long, um, but they weren't again the only ones because there's some day schools as well, largely called dame schools, uh, because they tend to be run by um, women uh, and. Uh, uh, they weren't brilliant education, but they did provide some sort of private education to fill in there. Uh, we've got uh, Susanna Myers had one. She, she was aged at 55 in 1841. And that was probably held in Baptist, uh, in the Crag Chapel, the Baptist Chapel uh, there. Uh, Anne Wright had one on Woodside Hill, that possibly in the first Methodist chapel there, probably in someone's house or something like that. And she was described as being the mistress of the Dame School in the 1851 census. When you call about mistress in 1851, she was aged 77. And uh, could say others describe themselves living in Horsa as either as schoolmasters or school mistresses. But we're not quite sure uh, whether they worked with these other people or whether they worked with the dame schools or whatever. So it's largely unknown, uh, unfortunately for us. So that's really looking at the sort of the, the teaching around in Horsa in the sort of 1830s. I'm sorry about these uh, photographs are a bit sort of uh, more, more modern than the 1830s, but uh, uh, in one of the trade directories of 1834, it said the manufacture of woolen cloth is carried on here very extensively and in the neighbourhood are fulling mills. And uh, so what is mentioning there, not by name, uh, will refer to David Haig's mill at Brookfoot, which is just off this map. Uh, this photograph really just to the side uh, down there where pear, pear tree cottages uh, where you can go off low lane and cross the beck to the uh, uh, to the cookridge side as well. Uh, he had it called uh, Long Mill down there as well, Hutchinson Co uh, Mill, uh, there was Woodside Mill and like I say that was probably the largest of them at the, at the time, like I say that was a five-story building. And they could say what they were doing there was some of the rudimentary processes in the uh, woolen industry, straightening the fibers out of the cloth there. 
also said in that trade directory uh, there were others for making paper. And again, David Haig was involved in this uh, and because he had a paper mill by the, again by the cottages down at Brook Foot. Because it sort of really continued down there, the uh, sort of the paper industry, because it was uh, now home to Stevenson's, uh, who makes sort of industrial detergents. That was owned by the Bentley family and still is today, although it trades under the name of Stevenson's. We'll come across them uh, when we look at the sort of development of uh, Horsef in the sort of early 1900s as well. We're going to say that's quite an important one, because a lot of the detergents they make down there today are used for the cleaning of paper. So the recycling industry, a lot of detergents are, are used in that to break up those fibres so that it can be reused again as fibre board and put into new paper around there. And then uh, we've also got here the uh, wood side, we've got the corn mill down there uh, that was uh, built in the 1780s, like I say uh, that was owned by the Wright family and still was in uh, 1838. The Watson family I mentioned earlier had Hawksworth Mill uh, in the woods, and like I said, that's just off sort of uh, um, when, when, when we look down at sort of Woodside Hill down there. I guess it still sort of continues today as as a, as a, uh, a as was a paper mill for quite a while. And then William Craven had a paper mill that opened in 1834 at Mosley Bottom as well. So there's quite a lot of uh, paper mills around there, and because paper was probably uh, quite easy to make in this area because of the water of the sort of the uh, beck coming down Woodside. And it said there were grinding corn here as well. Troy Mill, the old manorial coal, coal mill. Uh, Atkinson Milner uh, was the uh, miller there in 1834. And there's another, uh, obviously the corn mill down at Woodside, I just mentioned, James Wright was the miller down there. And within that trade directory, it also says, together with some tanneries. And uh, because the most notable being the one on Woodside Hill uh, that opened in 1816. I think that continued really to be, through to the 1950s. And it also said, from the quarries here, excellent stone is obtained of which considerable quantities are sent to London, Liverpool and other ports. In this period, it was quite a new industry around here as a commercial concern. Where we sort of looked up coming up Town Street, there were those quarries where St Margaret's School stands today. That was a small delf, and behind the HSBC uh, and in that area and, and on Golden Bank. But there weren't huge quarries uh, like we see down at Woodside today. Uh, these were sort of just quarrying stone for building the houses locally. But now within this period is that they were starting to expand because of a building boom that was happening in Britain. And that's what we really wanted. Some of the stone here, like I said, it uh, went across to uh, build, uh, I think, harbour walls at, uh, even on the Yorkshire coast uh, uh, as well uh, and, and other places. But it had been quite hard to export at that time, really until the coming of the, uh, of the railways. This would probably taken down um, onto the canal to be exported uh, out that way because there's no other way the quantities that was uh, demanded uh, and because they large pieces for ports and things like that, creating keys, uh, could have been exported and the other how. Um, so the first mention of sort of a quarrying in Horsa, because it must have taken on a small scale to begin with, uh, was in 1824. And uh, because other industries around uh, was the bleach mill at Dean Head, that's the off Scotland Lane uh, as well, because uh, that was bleaching linen and that was established in 1824. Another bleach mill was where the railway station uh, stands today at, at Horse of Station, I'm talking about that. That was owned by John Morfitt. And I uh, say, uh, with the coming of the railway, this moved higher up to the back of Dean Grange Farm off Scotland Lane as well. And it's that building that you can still see today. So if you walk down the track off Scotland Lane to Dean Grange Farm, continue down there, it's on your left-hand side, quite overgrown uh, today, uh, and because it's owned by the Inghams of Dean Grange Farm. And if you continue down that track, it's where it crosses across the railway line there and goes up to Cockridge the other side. So you can see from that railway bridge, the portal of the uh, Bramhope Tunnel from the Horse of Side. 
And, and of course, we've got some woolen manufacturers as well. But largely in this of 1830, it was still handloom weavers. Like I say, the mills that were here weren't very large concerns. And uh, like I say, most of those handloom weavers uh, were down back lane. And like I say, also on the cottages on New Road side that were being built by the fleece uh, across the road from there, uh, which still stand uh, there today. Uh, but their numbers really were in terminal decline. Uh, in 1821, there were 26 master handloom weavers in Horsef, but by 1834, that had fallen to 19. And they could say some of that loss might have been due to death, but some of my taken on at the, the larger mills elsewhere. So not particularly in horses, they might have gone out to Geisley and Rawdon, I'd say where the first larger mills were, uh, were, were rather than in horse surf. And, and that's probably where we go and look back to Samuel Marsden as well. He, when he brought that uh, uh, wool over from Australia, he had it made into a suit, a park mill. Uh, that's where Airedale um, uh, ventilation is today off the A65 there, that's where Park Mill stood. So it had been probably one of the larger mills uh, around here. And uh, some of them, as we'll see in a minute, uh, were of the handling with us, uh, formed like a, I guess a cooperative in order to, uh, to survive and open their own mill. Uh, but generally these handloom weavers, and there were sort of probably a dozen, I'm going to say a dozen of them in 1837, were doing specialised jobs that couldn't be undertaken in a mill, such as burling, mending and, and other things like that. Uh, and uh, I can say not all the processes were fully mechanised by the 1830s. And that's why we didn't see much larger mills come on until really the 1850s, 1860s around there. What was missing largely from those trade directors was the coal industry, uh, which was quite prevalent in Horsef at that time, as I mentioned last week. I guess it's largely taking place on the higher ground around here. And there were quite a few miners, as I'll, I'll mention later on. And really, it was the coming of the railways that sort of decimated the uh, mining industry here. It was quite poor coal, but the um, trains could bring in large quantities of very high quality coal, some of it coming from Middleton just off the city centre of Leeds. Uh, but it was the cost before that of bringing coal out to places because it'd have to come on wagons or it'd have to come on panniers on horses and things like that. So it was very small quantities could be bought, uh, brought in and you could say uh, it cost a lot of money there. That's probably why the coal industry uh, lasted uh, quite a long time, really into the 1850s uh, here around uh, there because the poor quality coal around here would have been much cheaper than the high quality coal that was now coming in by railway. And I say some of it before that would have come in by canal as well. But the difficulty there was bringing it up the hill uh, from like newly across that new bridge uh, in 1819. And especially up Carver Lane because of the reports of that it was in always in very poor condition, even into the sort of 1900s, is that it wasn't tarmac. There were very few lights down there as well. But we'll see that when we come to the sort of looking at horses in the 1900s. So looking at sort of daily life in Horsef as well, is that the population in the sort of 1830s grew very steadily, only really sort of talking about 75 people a year. And it because it hadn't exploded like the uh, nearby cities. You say there are already here a number of churches, you could say the Bell Chapel on the Green, uh, really called St Margaret's uh, Church. And the vicar there was the Reverend W. H. B. Stocker, because he came vicar in 1837, but he had been curate at St Margaret's Church since 1833, as the uh, previous vicar from 1823 was the William uh, Gordon. So he was, but he wasn't resident in Horsef. He was one of those um, sinecure type positions, because uh, he lived in Oxford. So he would have taken the sort of tithes and other things like that due to him and then paid the Reverend Stocker only a small amount back. Uh, and so basically was pocketing the money. And that was very common during Georgian times and into this period uh, uh, as well. Because the Reverend Stocker was one of three curates that uh, uh, lived in Horse of administering at the parish. And uh, Gasset, um, um, Horses still remained as part of the parish of uh, 
uh, Geisley, really until 1906. And we'll see, uh, I think I put on that sheet today, is that marriages couldn't take place in Horseth on the green until 1853. So just sort of uh, at the edge of this period we're talking about. And the son of the Reverend Stocker, uh, Nelson Stocker, uh, said, a uh, recorded in a diary uh, about life at this time of Horseth in the 1930s and into the 1940s. He said, living was somewhat primitive in those days. Most of the time there was um, most of the time there was no public water supply. People had to depend on rainwater and wells, superior drinking water being conveyed round in a barrel drawn by a donkey and retailed at a penny a bucket. Of course, there was no drainage system. The manufacture of beef and mutton carried out in a very public manner, that of pork in the open street. The parsonage was practically a public dispensary. But life like that was really to change in Horsef until the 1860s when we see the building of the uh, waterworks off Scotland Lane. And like I say, you had to pay for the water and it was quite rudimentary. So a lot of people wouldn't even be able to afford it at that time. You can say the focus of life being on town streets still. And we also see other churches uh, have been established, as mentioned before, the Grove Wesleyan one. Uh, there was a Methodist church down at Woodside. You can say that started life in a cottage uh, next to the corn mill that stood down there. Those cottages that stood in that, uh, in, in that ground were actually uh, raised uh, during fire practices uh, during the 1940s. Uh, and uh, to say uh, later on a purpose-built chapel uh, was built on Outward Lane. A Baptist uh, um, church set off in the same sort of manner as a lot of churches did uh, all over the country, setting off in front rooms or barns and places like that, and then eventually uh, building their own chapels. So the Baptists I guess they were, uh, were, had a, were in a cottage at the top of Broadgate Lane in 1801, and like I say, the first purpose-built chapel at Crag Hill was built in 1803. And then across the road, uh, the Sunday School was built in 1814. And uh, like I say, these were sort of uh, em uh, uh, emerging areas in Horsef at that time. Uh, like I say, we've we'll seen from an earlier map, there's very few people uh, living around there. Uh, and like I say, the um, bit on New Road side opening up when the fleece opened in 1830. And like I say, it was also a stage uh, coach uh, in uh, as well. And like I say, you can either go from uh, the coaches going from Leeds out to Ilkley. Like I say, they uh, came in at 7.30 in the morning and they only operated three times a week uh, when they were introduced in 1832. But there were quite a lot of other pubs that I mentioned uh, previously, um, just to no name some of them, there's a boot and shoe at the top of Back Lane, the horse and jockey, and now uh, the Queen's Arms, we know it, on Long Row, but changed its name in 1862, so it wouldn't have been known as the Queen's Arms in these days. Of course, uh, on the um, bottom of Town Street, there was the Black Bull and the King's Arms. The old ball as well, that was uh, started life in this period. I can say it was a, a different from building from what it was uh, like today. It stood sideways onto Brownbury Lane because it was rebuilt uh, a lot later on. And the Stanhope Arms were on the green in the last uh, area around there and moved down onto uh, the junction of Think Hill with the uh, what we know today as the Ring Road in 1840. Uh, so that's uh, in the period that we're talking about as well. And like I say, those properties, uh, uh, what was the uh, community set or the uh, housing office on the green, uh, that became back into a house uh, after it being the uh, uh, pub. Like I say, one time the agents uh, for the Stanhope family, uh, John Hardy lived in one, and uh, like I say, the owner after that uh, became John Gaunt of Woodbottom Mills. And uh, like I say, in this period, we're talking about the 1830s and the run up to the sort of 1840s, I mentioned the other week, was the Beer House Act of 1830, uh, so which has, um, circumvented uh, getting a license from a magistrate. You could fill in a form, I think you paid 
five pounds for a license because they that was a government thing of trying to wean people off drinking gin because they were uh, especially down in london they thought it'd be better for people to drink beer than it was to drink uh, uh, gin and therefore that's the whole reasoning behind the beer house act uh, but it meant a lot of other pubs started to operate because they could only sell beer and they could say you could carry beer out as well for so really this sort of first off licenses as well and you've had to um, go and get a license from the Skyrack licensing session but you didn't have to get a magistrate's permission to do that and you could say we then had a number of retailers of beer uh, probably about another 12 down here as well that opened really in the 1930s but that was a huge explosion right across Britain there were thousands of these beer houses open because I guess getting a license for a pub would have been a very expensive and time-consuming process but just paying your five pounds and filling in a form and having it stamped at the Skyrack sessions was a very simple process indeed so as I said before when we've sort of been looking there's a, a barrel of water on this photograph this is uh, taken at the bottom end of the park because at that part at that time the park nearly came down to the fleece and had its own entrance lodge as well because they were sort of largely demolished uh, with the building of, of the ring road but they could say the uh, chief landowners were principally uh, the Stanhope still uh, and they could say uh, they were promoters of the Leeds Liverpool Canal. They had a financial interest in Kirksall Forge, just off this area, being one of the larger employers around here as well. And they were really responsible for the administration of Horsuf. And uh, say they owned the Advalson, that's the right to appoint the vicar. So the Reverend Gordon, who was the absentee vicar down in Oxford, we probably find to be a relative or a friend of the families. That's how he probably got it. Uh, because it's rather like a, a, a powerful position to own the Advalson is that you could give it to who you liked and it was probably a quid pro quo uh, type thing. Um, an overseer uh, and surveyor were employed. Uh, this post started in 1822. It was really because of such a small population there really wasn't a need for a great administrative uh, type of thing and because they the Stanhope family had run the court and other things like around uh, here for centuries. He was employed in 1822 and that was William Arton or Ayrton and they could say uh, special sessions uh, were held uh, ev every fortnight. Um, I say we had two sort of law positions as well. There was uh, two men who were watchmen or constables uh, because they were partly being responsible for lighting any lamps uh, that would have been around and really enforcing during those long periods of darkness because uh, they the sort of uh, the, really been the forerunners of the police force and uh, they they wandered the streets for public safety around there. Uh, and they could say there were other men were uh, was the overseer I uh, could say people around here was re re were responsible for paying the local rate and it was the overseer who come house to house to collect the local rate uh, and uh, I could say they um, um, those taxes were used to, I guess, administer also from probably for road building and things like that. Uh, but one of them, principal ones, were for the poor rate. Uh, I guess those are the people who were destitute, uh, didn't have any income or, mon or were mo made unemployed. And they would have to apply to the overseer to actually get some parish relief. And this would be paid in cash until you're probably able to stand on your own feet. But really, it was legislation outside of horses that really changed things. In 1834, we had the Poor Law Amendment Act. And they could say, up until this period, you could say you applied to the overseer and he would give you a sum of money uh, if, if you were destitute, but you could live in your own home. But the Poor Law Amendment Act changed all that. And uh, you, say, uh, you then uh, was sort of, they wanted you to go and live in the workhouse. So probably in the 1830s, when this really came through, it forced every um, uh, uh, locality to have their own workhouse. So the Horsef workhouse uh, was upon Troy Hill, which still stands there today. But it probably wasn't a workhouse for very long within the Horsef community, uh, because we were in a union, uh, say, with Otley 
and other places and uh, we would have been made to send uh would have had to give money into the poor law union uh, in order to look after destitute people from Horsef. Um, so before that, when the overseers were giving out money, you, you would get a certificate of at birth to say where you were born. And that was very important, uh, really, because it went, when you went to see the overseer, you could say, look, I'm here from, I was born in Horsef, and therefore I can receive these funds because local people didn't like paying out for people who come from elsewhere. And so if you didn't have one of these certificates, they could actually deport you to the place where you came from. It might be Keithley or wherever it was. And like I say, that local constable would take you out uh, back to the place of your parish or, or your origin, and they would then have to pay it out for you. But like I say, the Poor Law Amendment Act sort of changed all that uh, because now these unions came quite large areas. The first workhouse, uh, so it served horse uh, area uh, beyond the old one up, up at Troy Hill, uh, probably came in probably late 1830s, was built down at Cross Green in Otley. That's really uh, near where Asda is today on the road that leads out to Poole in Wharfdale. So that's where the first workhouse was. And then they built the much larger one um, up uh, by the um, hospital in 1873. And because it was a very harsh regime, and that's why a lot of people were against it. And I guess it was meant to be so harsh, but you would do anything not to uh, get uh, into the uh, into into the workhouse as well. Because the Troy workhouse in the 1841 census wasn't mentioned as being a workhouse at that time, so it had obviously come to an end. But it might have been as a, uh, a, a as a, as a stopgap from 1834 until the one in Otley had been opened. I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, I'm just going to look around Horsef now, uh, at really what the uh, tithe award uh, meant, because uh, the tithes were a, a local ta uh, tax collected by the church, and it was really 10% of your sort of agricultural produce. Um, but they say there's a lot of problems with the Tithe Act because people now didn't grow their own produce because this was on the sort of the cusp of where people were now working in for employers. Before that, it was sort of a dual economy. You could do your bit of handloom weaving, but you probably have a bit of a small holding as well. And therefore, you'll grow or give that 10% of what you grew to the church uh, for that. Uh, but um, a lot of people couldn't, weren't doing that anymore and therefore in 1836 came the Tithe Commutation Act which meant that you could pay a fixed sum of money in, in lieu of that and they say this is really the reason why the Tithe maps were, uh, were drawn up. So they're really a sort of uh, a, an addition to the enclosure awards which uh, sort of uh, came through in the late 18th century and they were sort of allowed uh, for the landowners to divvy up the land really um, uh, at the expense of poor people who would have used the moors and other communal grazing rights uh, from that but the uh, fields were then enclosed they had to uh, create fences and walls and hedges and also lay out roads to, to a certain width and things like that uh, and um, you say this is why the so the tithe was map was drawn up to show uh, who owned what and to what extent uh, they owned it uh, uh, as well and um, you say the these tithes at that time went to the um, the Stanhope uh, family as, as well uh, and uh, you say the uh, as you can see Partly on here, we've got the naming of the fields for the first time. So this is the, uh, because they've got Horse of Hall Park around there. There's a hall up there. So we can see some of these things where there are farms off uh, Town Street. We mentioned sort of the brown cow was a farm and other things. But we can see how these fields came right the way down onto Town Street uh, uh, around here. So this will be the green at the bottom down there. That will be the Bell Chapel there. And across the road there, we have the uh, other houses on, on the green. And so we can see how these fields came right in. And here we've got 316. You can look at the uh, uh, the list at the side, 316, and you say it was named as Far Close there, and who owned it, a Mr Stone, I guess it's a Mr Stonehouse, uh, owned that field. So they knew 
who uh, had the fields and how much they were worth. And that's how they sort of uh, came around to uh, see how much uh, tithe uh, money they had to pay annually uh, uh, as well. I can say, as we see on this map, is that the green, which I pointed out before, uh, hasn't really changed that much around here. So over the road there on Fink Hill, that's the uh, St. Margaret's Church there, the bell chapel around there. So the green hasn't really changed at all. But what we see up here is how much narrower uh, Town Street was and said that was only widened really in the 1960s. And uh, you say, uh, we can see here very few, you can see some of the old cottages that were demolished in the 1960s unfortunately uh, because there's so many more people living on town street i said they demolished them in 65 66 and then uh, no one came along to build anything really until these cottages here until morrison's was built uh, 10 years later in 1977 and so we see really those properties being built within this sort of uh, 1820s to sort of 1840s, 1850s period are the ones that were demolished in the mid 1960s. And uh, I say we can see sometimes behind here some of these uh, folds which are going to be built later on as well when horses started to expand and uh, I say they wanted to build cheap houses on the minimum amount of land. I think they probably still do that today if you look at some of these sort of flats or apartments as, as they call them uh, as well. And uh, I say uh, there are a large number of shops around here, as I mentioned right at the beginning, coming down Town Street and onto Fink Hill. Uh, there were um, a look at the number of butcher shops here as well. Uh, on Town Street, there are three butchers and four grocery shops alongside two linen drapers and four tailors. In addition, I'm going to say on Fink Hill, there were four more grocery shops and a further five butchers. So that's going to show the importance coming down here of Fink Hill, where we imagine that Town Street has always been the main shopping centre, but it gives the impression down here that Fink Hill was just as important or even more important by having more shops on there. The most popular trade in Horsef, uh, which is probably quite unbelievable today, uh, was shoemaking and 27 people were employed making shoes in Horsef. I mentioned right at the beginning about the, um, I think I come onto the wrong slide there, but I might need to go back one. Oh, probably uh, as I'm on this one, uh, I mentioned about Upper Bank House uh, being built as well. And like I say, that was rebuilt 1838 to how we see it today. And that was built for the Morfitt family. He probably wanted to show his sort of uh, standing in society. So it'd been a very important house, but it, like I say, probably a large house because he had 10 children. So he probably needed 10 bedrooms uh, within that uh, as well. Because say his success, as you say, he had Mabgate Mills down in Leeds, a linen mill. Uh, say he hit hard times in 1870, in, in the 1870s, as did a lot of linen manufacturers, uh, largely because of the, the uh, 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 it was cheaper to make it elsewhere. At one time, really at the end of the sort of 18th century, uh, there was uh, enough grown in. Uh, uh, in Britain to support its own industry but as more and more cloth was demanded then it had to be brought in from the um, from, from northern Europe from the Baltic states really and that made it more expensive but also led to it leaving Britain open uh, to competition from elsewhere and really that's what caught up with Britain in the 1870s it was cheaper now to import finished linen than it was to go through the whole process of making it because uh, uh, it was a very uh, flax was imported it had to be retted down as a long stinky smelly process uh, for making linen and so really that's uh, affected the morphets there uh, as well and then, because say the other things happening as well is that the US, uh, after sort of independence, started putting uh, import taxes uh, and export taxes on, on products as well. So really, a lot of uh, industry went through hard times in the 1870s, because they're slightly outside our period around here. And then, if we're coming down to sort of a look at, at Newley uh, uh, as well, and. Uh, I seem to have got my notes uh, in the wrong order around here for some uh, reason, so just bear, bear with me. Uh, here we go. 
um, and uh, really the importance of Newley down here was the opening of the bridge in 1819 because that was a toll bridge as well and uh, Thomas Jacks uh, was the toll collector in the 1840s as well. We also had New Laves Hall down there because they since demolished the Stead uh, family lived uh, there and at Newley Grange it was the Micklethwaite family because they really owned a lot of land in Horsford for many years. Uh, otherwise because they Newley was largely made up of sort of uh, farms in that area find my cursor and then because they the opening up of New Road Side really or the beginnings of New Road Side after the road was completed in 1830 like I guess they'd be uh, mentioned before look at this area around here uh, as well when the fleece opened in 1830 at that sort of junction uh, just around here and the building of those cottages uh, around there because there was down here there was only low fold uh, which is assumed could have been an old uh, manor of Horseth and there'd be nothing else there at all and you can see how Horseth Hall Park comes all the way down nearly to the fleece you can say it's only when it was severed in the 1930s that we really lost this amount of the parkland as well and that's why there's no lodge today into Horseth Hall Park and you can say uh, round here at the bottom of by the by the fleece, because I know we've got here we've got Mr. Myers here as a butcher, but the first butcher there was Joseph Ingham, he was age 35, and Maria Thorne, age 30, uh, had a grocer's shop uh, down there. We we'll see how the growth of this area was between the uh, uh, two uh, censuses in 1841. There were just 26 houses along New Road side, so it was just really around the fleece. By 1840, uh, by 1851, there were 44 houses built along New Road side. We we'll see the importance of that really could be because the transport network had changed. It was no longer going up Butcher Hill. All the transport from Leeds was coming out here. It went uh, off to Bradford, um, down at the Star and Garter, as it was called, uh, down at Kirksall. That's where the road went to Bradford. Because you have to remember is that you couldn't go to Bradford from Horsford in those days because there wasn't the Ring Road Bridge. And if you crossed Carvley Bridge, that only went to Carvley, which meant you had to go to Green Gates, quite a, a long journey to get to Bradford in, in those days. And then, because say 1851, we see that there are 44 houses uh, along New Road side. And they could say only eight remained in the same um, occupation of the same family when I looked at that. And 10 new families had moved in as well. And those 10 had moved in had no prior association with horses. So we see how horses was growing when we looked at the census as well. Coming down to look at Woodside, I could say this is the map here uh, that the sanitary inspector uh, drew up, uh, I think, really from the late 1940s and then certainly into the 1960s. The red buildings here are the ones that were demolished around here, but we can see uh, how we got um, low lane coming across there. This is the Woodside Tannery, so this is Tan House Hill, and just across the road, that's Butcher Hill going up the other side there. So you can see how much property has been lost in the area. But that's really the key uh, community of Woodside was down there. And you can say it was all there in 1838. Uh, and you can say the valley had really not been developed at that time. You can say the focus down here, just across the road, probably just slightly off this map here, uh, was the corn mill. Uh, was owned by William Wright as well and uh, can say they not only just doing corn but they're also producing malt for the brewing industry and you say that's something that was in, tied back to the beer house act uh, and you can say this huge malting industry because people were drinking so much more beer and that's why we see coming in is that all these beer houses didn't actually brew their own beer like the pubs probably would have done and now depended upon outside brewers to supply them with beer so that's how Joshua Tetley started really and then they started just supplying all these little beer houses and then made their name from it and then built bigger and bigger breweries so because there was a large brewery down at uh, Kirksall which is now the um, 
uh, Leeds Metropolitan Universities or Beckett Park or whatever it's, I uh, believe Beckett, you know, I can't remember what its name it is at the moment, but that's where they're, um, there's a brewery there, uh, I think right through to the 1970s, 1980s, before being converted to a student hall of residence down there. And um, like I say, the, uh, um, we really didn't have much uh, other things down there, like I say, we had Brookville, quite a, you know, a mile further along there. There really wasn't much in between there as, as well. And then onto Troy Mills near the sort of uh, the railway station as, as well. Otherwise the valley was covered in sort of fields and trees at that time. And then looking at Town Street as well, uh, which I've sort of uh, um, mentioned uh, earlier as, as well. And I think I got these slides in the wrong order or the text in the wrong order when I was copying it the other day. Uh, Upper Bank House, which I gave you the story about, and then moving on to Station Road. And here we see it uh, before the arrival of the railway um, within this. We've got the old ball, which stood next to the side of Brownbury Lane, because they not rebuilt until quite a lot later on. And uh, you say, the railway came through here in 1846. And they can say the focus around here, you can see here, this is a manorial corn mill, and that's it sort of a, a dam around here, fed by oil mill Beck or Mosley Beck as it came down into there. And that's sort of the site of today, uh, there's modern flats and things along there uh, as well. And again, you had to cross a ford uh, before the building of the railway, and that was your way up to Cookridge uh, across there to meet again the Otley Old Road. Because there'd be a regional manorial coal mill down here was founded by the monks of Kirksall Abbey. The mill uh, right uh, eventually passed to Walter Stanhope in 1638. You'd have had to buy those because at the uh, time of the dissolution, is that Henry VIII would have tried to get as much money as he can for all the assets of the Abbey. So somebody probably bought it in between time and then uh, bought it, uh, and then he bought it uh, later on. And like I say, it was then known when the railway arrived here as Car Bridge Street, later renamed uh, Station Road. And I've just come to the last one, uh, to, just to finish on, of just looking at the census in 1841. I mentioned at the beginning that the population, I need to check my notes again, uh, was uh, 3,435 in 1831. Uh, a decade later, the, um, it had risen to 4,188 people. The majority of them uh, having been born and bred in the town. Like I say, many of those names on that census are still recognisable at the end of the uh, of the 19th century as being uh, living in here as well. The trouble is you've got to look at the 1851 census because the 1841 gives the uh, where they lived and the occupation and age of a person but didn't say where they were born. So you've got to sort of look at the both censuses together to see if they were born in Horsef, and they've sort of looked at the pages of those, um, and they can say most of those people weren't incomers into Horsef at that time. So I think probably just one more. Here we are uh, on, on it. Uh, and can say most. I can say most of those people, when you checked against it, because if this is looking at this, uh, the other census here of 1851, when you come across here, it says where born now. And uh, so some of these, um, I think that one's come from Buckinghamshire, but the majority of the people kept, who lived in Horsef in 1851 were born within a five mile radius of the town. And it was really only specialized jobs that came in when they're probably uh, from Lincolnshire and where a lot of uh, exodus was from the farming industries in those days, largely because of, of making bigger fields. Uh, and uh, like I say, a lot of sheep farming down there didn't require lots of uh, uh, labor as well. And that was a great change in the 1840s as well. Uh, the industrialization, uh, the second industrialization, uh, industrialization of the farming process. So I'll stop there because it's, it's a good place to start.